Let me welcome everybody to this, the first Patsy Robertson Memorial Lecture. Um, and I'm delighted that there are uh, so many people who, uh, from different parts of, uh, of the world who are uh, listening in. And that members of, I've seen several members of Patsy's family who have joined us. And it's very good to see them uh, also. It's nearly a year since Patsy died, uh, and I suspect she's often in all of our thoughts. I'm conscious that we uh, in the Commonwealth who knew and worked with Patsy uh, through that connection probably only knew one facet of uh, a remarkable person. Uh, but that experience nonetheless uh, enriched us still motivates uh, and inspires us and gives us reason to celebrate Patsy's life and contribution to the Commonwealth, particularly through this lecture. And we're extremely fortunate that our guest speaker, our first lecturer, is Dr. Anne Gallagher, the Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, uh, who will speak on the People's Commonwealth and I'd like to invite the Vice Chair of the Commonwealth Association, Vishaka Mukherjee, to introduce Anne. Thank you, Stuart. It gives me great pleasure to say a few words about our guest speaker, Dr. Anne Gallagher, by way of introduction. While some of our members have worked for the Commonwealth Foundation, all of us recognize the importance to us and other Commonwealth organizations of the foundation and of its leadership. Anne has broken new ground as the first woman and the first Australian to head the organization. And it is clear that she is a person of great talent and experience. A lawyer, practitioner, teacher, and scholar, her long international career has involved specialization in a wide range of areas, including human rights and the administration of criminal justice. She worked as a special advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, and she developed legislative and criminal justice responses to human trafficking and exploitation for ASEAN member states. Anne's work for human rights, justice, and equality has been widely recognized, earning her, among other honors, the Australian Freedom Award and the Peace Woman of the Year Award for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. In 2012, she was appointed Officer of the Order of Australia and named a 2012 hero by former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. As Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, Anne is the Commonwealth's ambassador for civil society, encouraging member states to listen to their people and to include civil society and Commonwealth organizations in all aspects of public dialogue. Since taking office in June 2019, she has launched several valuable initiatives. She has led the foundation to become a dynamic online presence, offering an engaging, influential, and popular series of People of the Commonwealth Critical Conversations, which has attracted thousands of participants. She has also helped the Commonwealth Short Story Prize to flourish at a time when cultural inspiration has been so important. So in conclusion, we could not have a better or more qualified and experienced person to speak to us on the people's Commonwealth. Please welcome Dr. Anne Gallagher. Thank you so much, Mr. Shaka. Commonwealth citizens, friends of the Commonwealth. When I was 
asked to deliver this lecture, I had to take a deep breath. I understood very well that this could be you to one of the great leaders of the Commonwealth. A woman whose courage, wisdom and grace did so much to unite our 54 countries. It is fitting, therefore, that I begin with a few words about Patsy Blair Robertson, a few words about the person and the principles and ideals that she championed. I've been in post a bit less than two years and only met Patsy properly on a few occasions. But in learning about her life, I feel that I've come much closer to learning about the Commonwealth, what it stands for, what it is, and especially what it could be. That shouldn't be surprising. In so many ways, the arc of Patsy's life resonated with that of the organization she served so loyally and championed so fiercely. Her childhood and young adult years in Jamaica gave her an insight into the legacies of the worst aspects of colonialism, insights that clearly shaped the role she would play in the Commonwealth. Learning about Patsy's life, I was struck by the clarity of her early commitment to just her instinctive rejection of inequality, her repudiation of unfairness in all its forms. Patsy lived to witness the evolution of the Commonwealth from her words, a rich man's white man's club, a relic of empire into something very different an organization that was voluntarily embraced by newly independent colonies of the former empire, embraced by a new wave of leaders who demanded equal treatment and an equal voice in this unique association of free states. Patsy witnessed, participated in what we must all agree to be the finest chapter in the history of our Commonwealth, its work in ending violence and apartheid in Southern Africa. Her accounts of the backroom politics, the divisions, the deals, and of course the personalities that dominated this chapter are riveting. It was through the words of Patsy that I learned how the Commonwealth Secretariat stood up against powerful member states and media interests that in her gentle words lacked an interest in racial justice. I learned of how a Secretariat fearlessly led by an individual who was much more general than secretary, stood up against those who were seeking to block progress towards independence for Rhodesia and South Africa. Through Patsy, I also learned how that era shaped so much of the modern Commonwealth, the Fund for Technical Cooperation, for example, which was used to nurture a new generation of public officials, young people who for the first time had the chance to become involved in the governance of their countries. Perhaps the greatest inspiration that I've drawn from Patsy's life and work relates to her unshakable belief that the Commonwealth is not just another club of states, that it is, it must be an association of peoples. Like the UN Charter, our own charter begins with those fine and stirring words, we the people. But unlike the UN, the Commonwealth has taken this idea much further through, for example, creating an intergovernmental arm, the foundation, that is explicitly mandated to advance the interests of civil society. This belief in the Commonwealth being an association of people is the shining thread that ran through the whole of Patsy's career. We see it in her nurturing of civil society groups who are working against apartheid. We see it in, in her setting up and leading the Commonwealth Association. We see it in her stealthy support of dissident politicians and their supporters. We see it in the Ramphal Institute, which she co-founded. Patsy was a subversive in the true sense, weaving what others have termed a web of subtle defiance against those who stood in the way of truth and justice. Patsy had many strings to her bow, but those who knew her best understood that journalism was her lifelong vocation. It is therefore appropriate that I now move to focus on an issue that I believe is at the core of her vision of the Commonwealth, freedom of expression. I'm not a media expert, 
but after 30 years as a lawyer, criminal justice practitioner, and international civil servant, I've come to understand the critical link between freedom of expression and the much larger idea of human rights. Without freedom of opinion and expression, without media freedom as a core element of that larger right, all else is at risk. From the right to health, to the right to participate in government, from the prohibition on torture, to the right to a fair trial, all hinges on the capacity of a society to understand what's going on. Intergovernmental organizations have played a vital role in elevating freedom of expression to the status of a universally recognized right. They've done the hard work of socializing us all to the idea that freedom of expression, including media freedom, is essential to the flourishing of democratic societies and a basic condition for development. And while the Commonwealth has not led the pack, we should not forget that through its charter, this organization too has loudly and clearly affirmed the right of every Commonwealth citizen to freedom of opinion and expression. And critically, the obligation of every Commonwealth state to protect that right. But on this human rights issue, as so many others, public commitment races ahead of reality. Over a third of Commonwealth member states now languish in the bottom half of the World Press Freedom Index. My own country, Australia, doesn't make the top 20 and the UK is even lower. Across the Commonwealth, journalists face intimidation and arbitrary detention. And I must place on record my legal opinion that Julian Assange in his present situation belongs in that category. Even worse crimes and human rights violations, including assassinations, are becoming more commonplace and widespread impunity exacerbates their lasting impact. In too many Commonwealth countries, counterterrorism and public security legislation is used to shield officials from media scrutiny. Whistleblowers exposing corruption are prosecuted and defamation and libel laws are wielded against public interest reporting. In almost every Commonwealth country, political and commercial interests are severely distorting the free flow of information. My informal litmus test, the capacity of the society to understand what's going on, is failing spectacularly across our Commonwealth. And there is reason to fear things are getting worse. The COVID-19 pandemic we're all living through has weakened commitment to freedom of expression and media freedom, most especially in those countries where that right was already in decline. And this already fraught situation is immeasurably complicated by the new media. How do we bring in the new gatekeepers of opinion and information whose operations directly affect freedom of expression? How do we require internet service providers, search engines and social media platforms to respect freedom of expression and to contribute actively to a diverse and plural marketplace of ideas? How do we deal with false and potentially misleading information in ways that don't erode existing freedoms? How should we decide what the limits are and who should be involved in establishing and enforcing them? I don't have any good answers to these questions, but I do know that we must be asking them. Perhaps there's never been a more dangerous time in history to stand on the sidelines and allow those whose interests are so different to our own, whose values are so far from ours, to be formulating the policies, taking the decisions, determining our future. More broadly, we must be standing up against the multitude of forces that are opposed to freedom of expression. We must be demanding protection of journalists and whistleblowers. We must be pushing for the prosecution of those who intimidate and attack them. We must be clear in holding our governments to account. And this is where the Commonwealth comes in. Freedom of expression, because of its fundamental nature and its inherent challenge to power, is very much the canary in the coal mine. If the Commonwealth cannot step up, if it cannot, as an organization, demonstrate its commitment to this basic value, then the credibility of the Commonwealth as a values-based organization is seriously at risk. We must push our member states. We must mobilize the broader Commonwealth family to act in ways that demonstrate real commitment. 
whether that is in advancing the draft Commonwealth principles on freedom of expression and the role of the media, or in calling out member governments that are acting in violation of our charter's commitments. We must be firm in our resolve, united in our efforts. Anything less is a grave disservice to the Commonwealth and to the hard work of the many dedicated individuals, including Patsy, who came before us. I'll finish up by making a brief detour to an anniversary that is upon us. 10 years ago, the Eminent Persons Group, established by heads of state, issued its report on the future of the Commonwealth. Its job was to ask and to try and answer one question. How best to increase the effectiveness of the Commonwealth, its institutions and activities, so that member states and their citizens are well served by an association that is greater than the sum of its parts, justifying continued affiliation, participation and collaboration of all its member states. I can remember reading that report, marveling at its passion and vision, which two decades at the UN had not prepared me for. Now that I understand the Commonwealth better, now that people like Patsy have shown me what it means and has meant to so many, the report makes much more sense. This is an organization that was born in passion and vision. The reverse side of that is sobering. And for me, a core message of the report. Without passion, without conviction, and a strong sense of mission and purpose, the Commonwealth is destined for irrelevance and obscurity. In the words of the report's authors, reinvigoration and refocus do not happen through complacency or inertia. It is complacency and inertia in vital aspects of the Commonwealth's values that currently pose the most serious threats to the continued relevance and vitality of the Commonwealth itself. It is helpful to look back on the report after the tumult and uncertainty of the past 10 years. Many of the recommendations are yet to be realized, but one transformational change based on the first recommendation of the report was the adoption of the Commonwealth Charter. We should never ever underestimate the power of this document. These are not the words of the Secretariat or the Foundation. They're not the words of Commonwealth Civil Society. These are the commitments of our member states commitments that they freely entered into. Our member states must be held accountable to those commitments, commitments to human rights and to solidarity, especially with small and vulnerable Commonwealth countries, commitments to democracy, to equality and to the rule of law. The Charter is also a roadmap for our entire organization. It should, in my view, be the basis of everything we do the lens through which we evaluate our impact and our effectiveness. In the foundation, we have elevated the charter to that role. It is the framework and the reference point for our new five-year strategic plan. The entire focus of our work, including our new priorities, climate, health and freedom of expression, is explicitly directed towards the charter, explicitly directed towards the realization of the principles and ideals of the Commonwealth as set out in the Charter. The Eminent Persons Report is rich in insights, but for me, one aspect stands out. The conviction organisation's legitimacy. They are right, of course. Solidarity is a health project. It is fundamental to be united by only the most tenuous connections of history and language is somehow much more than the sum of its parts. The Commonwealth ideal of solidarity has been sorely tested over the past decade in ways that the authors of the Eminent Persons Report could never have imagined. To take just one recent example, our organisation comprises countries that are today right at the top of the vaccination league tables and countries that are languishing right at the bottom. Those tables make clear that our smallest and most vulnerable member states derive no practical benefit from their membership of the Commonwealth. They derive no benefit when it comes to protecting their citizens from disease and death. They derive no benefit 
when it comes to protecting their economies from catastrophic meltdown. We can do much better than this. We must do much better than this. At the very least, we should be coordinating our efforts to ensure that countries who need it receive help with the supply or manufacturing of vaccines. We could set the bar even higher by, for example, encouraging Commonwealth member states and institutions to take a strong and unified position on the question of intellectual property rights over COVID-19 vaccines and medicines. And the Commonwealth should be out in the front of advocacy, using its many platforms to loudly and persuasively advance the moral and economic case for equitable access to vaccines and medicines. The case is clear. It must be articulated with precision and passion and communicated through and beyond the Commonwealth. On this issue, and on a few others I've touched upon, it is time for our Commonwealth to show the world what solidarity looks like by standing up and speaking out. In October, the Foundation will be marking the 10 year anniversary of the Eminent Persons Report. We'll be doing that with a special event in our Critical Conversation series that will bring several of the Eminent Persons together with a group of young Commonwealth leaders and change makers. Their brief is to discuss and debate the future of the Commonwealth. We've chosen this format deliberately. To understand the Commonwealth, we must understand its history, most especially the challenges it has faced and fought to overcome. But the future of our precious organisation does not belong with my generation, or indeed Patsy's. It is in the hands of a generation that was not part of the passion and idealism of the early days, a generation that is still to be persuaded of the Commonwealth's value as a force for good in the world. We cannot live off past glories. We must reach out to our young people. We must bring them into the Commonwealth family. We must work with them to create a Commonwealth that everyone is prepared to fight for. It is right that I finish up by coming back to Patsy. When thinking about the future of our beloved organization, we should be asking ourselves, what kind of Commonwealth would Patsy Robertson want? What kind of Commonwealth would she be urging us to fight for? Deep down, we all know the answer. Patsy would be urging us to fight for a Commonwealth that is unswerving in its commitment to human rights, to equality, to justice and the rule of law. She would be urging us to fight for a Commonwealth that is a force to be reckoned with on the world stage, a Commonwealth that shapes global policy on issues that matter the most to its people. She would be urging us to unite in defending our smallest and most vulnerable member states. She would be urging all of us, whatever our connection with the Commonwealth, to be brave in our defense of Commonwealth principles and ideals. I wish I knew her better, but I know that Patsy would have applauded the eminent persons when they captured, in a few short words, their vision for our Commonwealth. We aspire to a Commonwealth that is in harmony with the future, an association that draws on its history, utilizes its strengths, pursues the common interests of its members, and seizes the opportunity to help them and others shape a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for that uh, fascinating, challenging and inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, I don't think we could have had a better uh, first lecture or a more relevant one uh, to begin the series. And I, I, I know that Patsy would have approved, not just in terms of your emphasis on freedom of expression, which was such a, an important cause to her, uh, but also in, in, in correctly reading, I think, how she would have felt about uh, uh, many of those issues you, you touched upon. Now, I am uh, asking uh, questions to be put into the chat, um, and I don't see anything at the moment. Um, so I do ask you to do that. I know there are questions, um, not only about what Anne has said, but also about perhaps what she hasn't said. Um, but which you know she might have something to say upon. Um, maybe I could begin, Anne, by just asking um, 
you you've you've uh, challenged the Commonwealth to act in a number of important areas on on COVID, uh, in terms of sort of Commonwealth solidarity, in terms of freedom of expression and upholding the Charter and so on. How difficult is it for it to galvanise the Commonwealth in a situation where the kind of lifeblood of the Commonwealth, which is its consultative capacity, its coming together capacity, has been so diminished by by the current pandemic. Thanks for starting me on a, a tough question, because of course I have never been formally a part of any Chogum, so the very recent history for you is really the only history I know. And I understand very well that this, this is a challenge on so many levels, not least for an organisation that is so built on human relationships and human connections and connections between countries that may not otherwise ever uh, be so evident in another intergovernmental setting. So I do think that these times are challenging for us all, but out of challenge must come opportunity. And I look at this meeting, for example, I look at the fact that for our own board meetings, our own governance meetings, we're getting a higher engagement from our high commissioners, from our governors than ever before. I'm seeing that the foundation has had a chance to uh, connect with civil society, the Commonwealth civil society, in a way that is absolutely unprecedented for us. If I can make a prediction, it's certainly that the Commonwealth People's Forum will be changed forever. Never again will it be a few hundred people in uh, a small room in some corner of the Commonwealth talking together. Any future Commonwealth People Forum will involve thousands and thousands of people across all of our Commonwealth countries. So in that respect, I feel that the last couple of years has thrown up opportunities for a deepening of engagement with the wider Commonwealth than we ever, ever imagined possible. And what I really hope is after all of the dust has settled and we're back to something that re resembles uh, normal, that we grab these lessons and that we run with them. Certainly in the foundation, we're absolutely determined to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anne. Um, we've got um, a question that's come in uh, on the chat from Kay Richmond. Um, and uh, as far as I understand it, and uh, we may ask Kay actually to, to speak on this, um, he says that some of the comments, uh, and I think about freedom of expression, do not reflect the record on SDG 16, and he points to a reference for that and asks about the difference. Um, and would you like him to amplify that or is there enough there for you to go on? Well, I can jump in and just say one thing, and hopefully that will um, provide at least part of a response to Kay's point. Um, I, I've always relied on the World Press Freedom Index, uh, which I think is uh, quite a ruthless evaluation of uh, press freedom in, uh, in all countries. And uh, definitely the SDGs have now added another depth uh, and give us more nuance when we start, we go on the journey of evaluating press freedom. But I think definitely the overall trend within the Commonwealth and more broadly is down. And it's something that we should all be extremely worried about. I'm unequivocal on that point. Thank you, Anne. Um, and there's another question here from Nicholas Watts, um, who I think you will know. Um, so, his question is how you think that the Commonwealth, Commonwealth organizations might respond to the situation, the current situation in South Africa. Uh, Arif Saman has suggested that uh, the independent forum of Commonwealth organizations should convene with others to consider what Commonwealth organizations could contribute. Uh, the Commonwealth is proud of its role in ending apartheid. How do we, um, how do we help restore the optimism of the Mandela era and prepare for the renewal of South Africa and in particular KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah, thanks very much, Arif. And again, 
Uh, not a question that's easy to respond to. I would, and this I think very much relates to a couple of other questions that I'm seeing in the chat. I would love to see the Commonwealth organizations, the accredited organizations and the many members of the Commonwealth family be in a position to leverage uh, a, a much stronger uh, position from Commonwealth heads of state themselves, from the Commonwealth, the official Commonwealth institutions. I think that would be the ideal that we'd be looking for. We'd be looking for much more cohesion and bravery and solidarity amongst Commonwealth member states when critical issues such as what's happening in South Africa come out. And that's where the Commonwealth organizations can, um, they can get their energy and their momentum. I think on their own, they have, they continue to have a very important role to play, to flag these situations when they arise, to draw attention to them, to always make the link with the Charter and with Commonwealth values to point out when member states are violating their own commitments. This is something that must happen and it must happen throughout the Commonwealth. But I agree with you that this is, yeah, when it comes to calling out member states, this is an area where the Commonwealth has had uh, an especially uneven record, particularly over the last decade or so. And that's something that um, yeah, I think we could probably devote, definitely devote the rest of this discussion period to. Thank you. Um, and just just on that topic, there's um, a question from uh, David Page about the Charter and about upholding the Charter and how weak uh, the Commonwealth seems to be in holding its members to account when they fall short of those values. And, and then there's another question um, which um, which uh, talks about uh, the mechanisms for civil society organizations um, and national human rights institutions and other associations to hold states collectively accountable for their duties under the charter. And I suppose I could add to that, um, and I don't know, you know how far you've got into this so far in your role, um, the, the Commonwealth's own watchdog, watch, watchdog the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, and whether that should be involved to a greater degree than at present uh, in upholding the Charter. Have you got specific thoughts on, on that side? Well, Stuart, uh, Stuart, when I speak about the need for the official Commonwealth institutions to be at the forefront of championing the Charter and the, the values of the Charter and therefore of the Commonwealth, I am of course speaking of entities such as CMAG. So clearly this is an area that um, outside the immediate remit of the foundation, but definitely an area that we all have an interest in. And I think I can take the question around civil society uh, in, in that, that civil society has such an, and when I speak about civil society, I'm speaking about it in the broader sense as uh, as was, uh, I think it was, you know, Holly talks about, we're talking about national human rights, institutions, community groups, all of those that are working together to, to make their societies better and to hold governments to account. I think the pressure of civil society on the Commonwealth to do its job, it must be unrelenting. It absolutely must be unrelenting. And I think it's particularly when it comes to human rights. You know, I've, I've worked now on human rights for 30 years and this is, there's so many contradictions and dilemmas there. So human rights is all about, it's all about power. It's about taking power away from those who have too much and giving power to those who don't have enough. So it's about taking power away from the state and giving it to the people, taking power in many cases from men and giving it to women, taking power from adults and giving it to children. And we know through our own experiences, our own professional and our personal experiences that nobody gives up power easily ever. So it's this, this battle for human rights can never be uh, like a, a one-off thing. It's, it's a long, grinding war that 
we must all be involved in. And I think when it comes to, to governments, we, we just, you know, we have to be, we also have to be realistic. <laughs> I remember when I was at the UN working in the UN's human rights system and uh, somebody once described to me, uh, it, it was just such a great metaphor because I've never, well, I've never forgotten it anyway. And he said, look, the human rights system as it exists in, um, at the international level, at the regional level, but also at the national level, it's a bit like the fox uh, building the hen house. The fox has sworn off chickens. The fox has promised that um, he or she is never going to eat chickens again. But the fox just wants to leave enough holes just in case. So you never know what's going to happen in the future. So the hen house is weak. The hen house is not as strong as it should be because there is a tension between the power of the state and the right of citizens and communities. So we have to acknowledge that space and we have to lean into it with all of our individual and collective efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, there, there are a lot of questions coming in now and it's a little bit difficult to uh, to group them but uh, l let me ask you a question about uh, your relationship with the Commonwealth Secretariat um, and in particular this is from Terry Dormer um, and in particular uh, the, 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 the relationship that the Foundation has with the Secretariat um, at Choggins and you know we've had now uh, Choggins postponed twice and yet it's so much the heartbeat of the Commonwealth and what we do. Um, Terry would like to know uh, how you see that relationship going up to the Choggins. I suppose I would add to that, you know, uh, is does there come a moment when the Foundation feels it needs to, you know, step outside that relationship and, and actually uh, convene, uh, operate its own convening power, if you like, to tackle some of these issues? Uh, okay, a great question. Another difficult one. You're really serving them to me uh, <laughs> this time. So the, the, for, the foundation is the Commonwealth. So this was very important to me when I came in. The foundation is one of the pillars of the Commonwealth. And as I mentioned in the, at the beginning of my, um, like my, interve my earlier intervention, this sets the foundation, this sets the Commonwealth apart from any intergovernmental organization I've ever worked with. And I've worked with uh, almost most of the major intergovernmental organizations. None of them have got an entity that is specifically devoted to supporting and advancing the interests of civil society. That's, that's so precious. It's so unique. And I think we need to really appreciate that and figure out how we can work with it. But the foundation can't be separate from the Commonwealth. I, I feel like that would be a massive mistake. That would, you know, then the foundation might as well be a really great NGO. The foundation is part of the Commonwealth family and its battles must be for the people of the Commonwealth, which means that we must, in the words I used before, we must lean in to the Commonwealth. We must not under any circumstances, I think, move out. And for me, that involves us leaning into all aspects of the Commonwealth. I think that the, um, the civil society, if the Commonwealth is to be true to its vision of being an organization that's not just a club of states, but a, um, an association of peoples, civil society should be at every Commonwealth meeting. They, they should be at every ministerial, for example, not as a special dispensation, but as part of the cut and thrust of these meetings and as part of the Commonwealth identity. I think it's wonderful that we have a Commonwealth People's Forum, but I, I'm still not, it hasn't been explained to me in ways that I would, um, I can understand why civil society in some form or another is not part um, a more part of the more formal chogam, you know, perhaps not the the absolutely formal heads of government meeting, uh, but but other aspects of chogam. 
So I, I think this is, the foundation can do a lot. We've become much, much closer to the Secretariat over the last year or two. And that's a development that I think is really important. We can do different things. I sense that the foundation can push in ways that perhaps uh, are more difficult for the Secretariat. We can maybe be a little bit more nimble. We were able to, for example, totally reorient our annual grants call to deal with COVID-19. Uh, we've been able to run these critical conversations and to really push the agenda on some fairly contentious sort of issues. But always, always, we need to be working towards the same purpose. I, I, I think anything uh, that is that that it would deviate from that would for me be an absolutely massive mistake that we must avoid at all costs. Um, and one of the members of uh, Patsy's family um, who are in attendance uh, uh, at your lecture um, has been Robert Gillespie, um, Gillespie and um, and he has put he's taken <laughs> taken us up on the question of freedom of expression in so far as putting what he would regard as a, uh, a skeptical view of climate change, which is not remotely mainstream. So I feel in a way it's duty, I'm duty bound to put this question to you. Um, he says that he takes the view that fossil fuels as the lowest cost large scale source of energy are likely to remain the dominant energy source for many decades and are desperately needed by the poorest countries including in the Commonwealth, and believes that um, to resolve so many of the education, health, transport, and perhaps equality ch challenges uh, more quickly and affordably and with less risk than alternatives being promoted. And perhaps in answering that, Anne, you could also uh, say something about what you feel the Commonwealth's collective input should be to the COP26 meeting, which I think we all recognise as being so important. Thanks very much, Stuart. And also to Gillespie, it's such a such an honor to to have you here. And, and I really, uh, yeah, I really appreciate and feel humbled that members of Patsy's family have have come to this event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look, I the climate crisis in a way, <laughs> if uh, Maybe there's another canary in the coal mine. It's not just freedom of expression. It's also the climate crisis in the sense that this is really forcing us to confront such basic, basic questions. I think we can have, we can agree on the general science around climate change, which to me seems fairly well established, but we can have massive, massive disparity in how we feel is the best way to respond to that. And that's really where the interests of countries are absolutely colliding. And you may well be right that certain uh, mitigation strategies that are now on the table and getting all the attention, they maybe what hasn't happened is the proper analysis of the impact of these on those who have much less cushioning than the ones who are actually holding the discussion. So I think that once again, if we're going to, if we're going to work on climate, we have to go back to these, these other basic principles of making sure that everybody is heard and making sure that the interests of, especially of the smaller and more vulnerable states that can never stand up in international fora the way the big, the big ones can. They can never throw around that weight. They can never have their voices heard in the same way. The Commonwealth, and this goes on to your second question, Stuart, I think the Commonwealth's role is to elevate these voices. Look, this is, this is, the, this is the Commonwealth's unique selling point. This, this is the thing that makes this organization so different to any other. And I think if the Commonwealth can't come together and articulate what its smaller and most vulnerable member states need when it comes to action against climate change, then once again, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're doomed to irrelevance into the future. Yes, thank you. And that very much uh, plays into a question we have here. Um, and I can't actually see the full name, so I can't, I can't give you that name at the moment, um, about small small states, uh, the smallest member states, um, the 
funding of uh, uh, the way that uh, cutbacks have uh, it hit their funding, uh, what we need to do to stimulate um, funding partners to do more um, and to help those countries develop their economic strength. Now, clearly, small states, the whole emphasis on small states is one that is, is a particular priority for the Commonwealth, given that most Commonwealth countries are small states in, in that respect. Um, and I, perhaps I could link that with another question, um, which is uh, about working through other organizations. And, you know, you, you obviously have much experience of the UN system and of uh, the international system as well. And um, uh, Bala uh, Chandra Mohan asks, Commonwealth countries are members of other organizations, G7, G20, ASEAN, SARC, etc. What attempts do we need to work? What attempts do we need to work with these organizations to leverage multiple identities and priorities uh, that individual member states of the Commonwealth have? Um, okay, I'll give it a go. I'll go to the last one first and then please come back to me as I inevitably fail to answer the first part of your question because I might have forgotten it. Um, so in terms of working with other intergovernmental organisations, uh, I think everyone has a great interest in addressing this crisis of multilateralism, in addressing the fact that the, the role and the influence of intergovernmental organizations is on a trajectory that, at least in my sense, is not uh, in conformity with international solidarity. So this is something, whether it's ASEAN or the European Union or the United Nations, uh, whether it's a human rights part of the United Nations or the WHO, these, these, everyone, I think, is experiencing the same thing for the same reasons. And this is something that I think needs, if our organisations can come together, if they can unite, if they can work together, um, in, in particularly around issues that just matter to everybody, for example, climate change and health, then I think we, we do the two things of perhaps being more effective through the multilateral process. And we also strengthen the legitimacy of multilateral systems and individual organizations. So, but you know, it's also, <laughs> it's one thing to say we should all work together and it's another thing to actually, uh, to actually uh, make it happen. So my experience at the UN, for example, a couple of decades was that everyone talks about collaboration and cooperation, but everyone, or at least every agency, wanted to be the one that was in charge of that collaboration or cooperation. So, you know, it's, it's we're working, we're working uh, against very human kind of instincts that manifest themselves at the organizational level. But I think that the, the pressures are there now where uh, we can see that the dividends for cooperation are real and the cost of not working together, of not having each other's backs in the multilateral space are likely to be very high. Um, thank you, Anne. And uh, the first part of the question was really about the, the state of uh, small, small uh, states. Um, and that was actually, uh, I think it was from Mark Robinson. I just could see Ma on the screen. So that's Mark Robinson who asked that question. Uh, and perhaps I could just bracket that with the thought that, uh, you know, we're all conscious that uh, one or two Commonwealth, Commonwealth countries have stepped up their donor support um, for uh, multilateral support during the pandemic. But there are others, um, and as a Brit, I'd say notably the UK, which have reduced their support, which is hitting directly uh, some of those small uh, states uh, very grievously in important priority areas. So I wonder if you could say something about how the Commonwealth helps that, what should be its natural constituency, uh, namely small states. Well, solidarity comes in many forms, doesn't it? Uh, we can talk about our commitment to small and vulnerable member states of the Commonwealth, uh, and then we can actually do something. And 
I think it's probably appropriate that we, we measure uh, commitment in terms of actions and not in terms of words. So I agree with you that much, much more can be done within the Commonwealth space to support small and vulnerable Commonwealth member states. And that's why in my talk, I really sing, singled out the issue of vaccines and inequality in the distribution of vaccines because, you know, I, I'm not a logistics person or a, a, a finance minister or something like that, but I, I still don't understand why it's so hard. I don't understand why, and now I'm speaking really frankly, I don't understand why Commonwealth member states couldn't have come together and the ones with loads and loads and loads of surplus vaccines that are surplus to their requirements and they know that they're surplus to their requirements. They knew months and months ago why they weren't, the why they didn't decide to at least with our small and most vulnerable member states will make sure that they have enough vaccinations. Maybe even set the bar quite low and say, well, let's make sure that at least their frontline health workers have sufficient vaccinations. Let's just make a commitment, any commitment. But the easiest thing didn't happen. The, the most easy thing didn't happen. And that's where I really worry because if we're failing at this hurdle, which shouldn't really be a hurdle. I really worry about the depth of the Commonwealth's commitment. And I'm not just saying, talking about a handful of member states, the depth of the Commonwealth's commitments to its smaller and most vulnerable member states. I think we have reason to worry. Thank you, Anne. Um, and what may well be our final question, depending on your time, we know that you are a member of what one might describe as the, uh, the Rifkin Committee on the future of uh, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And we've all been awaiting their report. Is there anything you can tell us about, uh, if not the detail of that report, but maybe the direction of travel? Okay, well, first of all, I have to say that uh, alongside me learning about the life and times of our wonderful Patsy Robertson, me being a member of this committee has given me a real insight into, into the Commonwealth. Because of course, I think you, you probably all know that at least three of the members were members of the eminent persons group. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's been a very deep dive for me into the history and the culture of the Commonwealth. So I'll put that to one side. What I do wanna to say to you is that we have our last meeting tonight. We meet very late at night, and that's to accommodate our very wide time zones. So our last meeting is tonight, which is to finalise our report. Uh, and all I can say is that within this group, there is, these people are champions of the Commonwealth. They are, they are, they have the passion that I was talking about. They have the, the sense of history and a sense of the future. So it's been a massive privilege for me to be on the committee and uh, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to finalizing the report and hoping that uh, it does the service that the committee was, um, yeah, it, it meets, it meets the, the task that it was set. I should say it like that. And just, you know, just, I just wanna finish very briefly, if you don't mind. I know that Gillespie has made a point about and I just want to highlight that because I think it's a, it, it's a good point to end on that the poor uh, and those in our, like those in our small island developing states, they are truly at the sharp end of climate change. And climate change is not just one issue amongst many others. This is going to cut across everything. This is going to, this is going to cut across all of the rights that are set out in the Charter, all of the goals and the aspirations in the Charter are going to be challenged by this. So I, I absolutely agree that this is truly the litmus test for our organisation and for its future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I'm glad you've been glancing at the chat. How, how you've managed to do that and still concentrating on answering questions is beyond me. But um, I'm glad you have. Uh, been some very complimentary remarks too about your lecture um, but rather than 
repeating those to you. I'm going to ask Sir Peter Marshall, who is um, uh, a kind of legendary Commonwealth figure in his own right, uh, to give a vote of thanks. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, to begin with, Anne, if I may call you Anne, um, I am slightly nervous with Stuart being in the chair because in his young liberal past, there was an occasion when a vote of thanks was put to the vote and lost. Which you can imagine, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it sort of, uh, uh, attracted to the meeting a certain unexpected quality. And the, the, the sins of the thanker were visited on the thankee. That is not going to happen this time. We want to thank you very, very sincerely for all that you have said, and not only for all that you have said, but for all the thought and work which obviously has gone in to what you've been saying to us, the experience and the inspiration and the encouragement that you've given us. I wouldn't attempt to uh, uh, summarize all you said, and what we're going to have, we've got a recording, we can listen to it all. But listening to you, I would say that each, well, so many of the things you said set off all sorts of different ideas sparking in different directions. But I think I will pick out one, and that is what you were saying about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Now, because that I think is the test of any great worthwhile organization. And the question is, where does it come from? How do you ensure that the whole is greater than the sum of the part? Now, a lot of it is asking the right question. But a lot of it must be accepting the responsibility for answering them. And I think as I listen to this, and we talk about the Charter and so on, implicit in the Charter is not only an ex exposition of what we want, but an acceptance of responsibility that we'll try and get it. And that, um, that's not saying it's very easily done, but I think the Commonwealth, as an organization, and as a, not more as an organization, as an association, is, is as well placed as anybody on earth to do it. But in the meanwhile, let us say thank you and have a lovely meeting tonight. Thank you very thank much, you Peter. Very much. <laughs> and um, it only remains for me to add my own thanks to, to Anne again. Um, to apologize to those whose questions I, I haven't taken, um, but we hope to have um, a, 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 a recording of this, uh, as Peter has said, and also perhaps if, um, if Anne has a text, we, we might be able to publish that as well. Um, so that would be absolutely brilliant. So um, could everybody, uh, with whatever device they may have to hand, uh, indicate their approval of Anne and her lecture? today. Thank you very much.